There we go. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay. Uh, this is Fish Epping Fishers. Um, take the talk title as you will. Uh, for Circle City Con. And just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a SIG writer and a malware researcher for the Emerging Threats team at Proofpoint. Uh, I also am a core team member of the OISF, which is the nonprofit foundation behind uh, Suricata Signature Development. So those guys can have houses and stuff. Um, traditionally, Emerging Threats has done a lot of coverage and really been known for their coverage of exploit kits. Um, but as anybody's been paying attention, the exploit kit landscape has kind of went away. Um, kind of starting with the decline of Angler and the disappearance of those guys. Um, so lately I've had a strong focus on credential phishing, which has kind of picked up and filled the void there. About a year ago we didn't have uh, the best coverage of credfish because it just wasn't that much of a threat. Like EKs were blowing everything up. Um, but now since the landscape has shifted, uh, it's more important for us to have co coverage of this type of, this type of threat. Um, if you haven't been paying attention to credfish in like 10 years, not much has changed. There's some new obfuscations, some new things, um, but there are a lot of better ways that we can kind of detect this stuff. So my talk is basically about making this. Um, data from the Goonies, making a lot of different tools that work sometimes, uh, are pretty quirky, and uh, kind of get the job done. So everything I'm going to talk about is up on my GitHub. Um, you can <laughs> download these tools, use them, abuse them, uh, and definitely don't submit any bug tickets because there's no problems whatsoever. Um, <laughs> So kind of what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about acquiring source, so the fish kit uh, backend stuff, the PHP code, all that. We're going to talk about uh, why timestamps are important in this. I know if anybody loves forensics, you should probably also love timestamps, and uh, they play an important role here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the actual analysis of the credential fish, some automation you can do around it, um, some obfuscations, and then finally uh, writing signatures for this stuff. So you're a scammer. You want to find a new kit. Um, basically, all you have to do is go to PayPal, or not PayPal, but YouTube, uh, and search for like PayPal scammer, search for eBay scammer, kind of whatever you want. Um, and this is two, 274, two, then three zeros, whatever that number is. <laughs> Talking's hard. Um, that's a lot. Um, and these guys just kind of abuse YouTube for uh, marketing purposes, and there's a lot of like free stuff you can get here. Um, alternatively, you can go to a not suspicious at all website and download the backend kits for PayPal, banks, eBay, Amazon. Branding is important. Um, so Hydra. make sure <laughs> make sure you're uh, you know downloading it from a really great site and then you know spilling in web designer not of the utmost importance here. But basically, the idea is that all this stuff is out there really easily uh, and, and can be found. So what they'll do is they'll find they'll find a kit, whatever brand they want to fish for. They'll download it, maybe they get sent it through Skype, maybe it comes through Trillion, maybe it comes through a well messenger, or whatever. They'll unzip locally on their machine. They'll edit the email um, inside a PHP file. So basically the fish kits are, you know, once they, when somebody fills out all their information, it's going to use PHP mail 95% of the time to mail the stolen credentials to the attacker. Um, then they'll zip it back up, they'll upload it to a server, and then they'll unzip it, and then they're kind of ready to go. So these are a couple examples of some readme files. Um, and all of these really miss kind of a crucial step on the part of the attacker. Uh, this one's pretty nice from Team PG. They hope it brings you luck. They're very polite. Uh, they kind of give you an idea of what to do. Um, this is important for later. Uh, that's a pretty unique name for a .php file. Um, and this is a readme that's found in their free kits. Some of them are very comprehensive. Um, they can talk about how um, Every page will be encrypted with AES JavaScript, uh, which is really not smart. It's really easy to beat. Um, they won't get detected by AV's toolbars, blah, blah, blah. But this one's very robust. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't cover the most important part. Um, this one is another one that also is missing the critical portion here. Um, they actually tell you not to do some things, like don't delete this folder and don't delete uploads. Um, does anybody see a step here that they're kind of missing? on the part of the scammer and the fisher. In, in none of these readmes do they say to delete the archive after you've uploaded it, um, which is great. Don't. Uh, just keep leaving it there. It's awesome. Um, so on my worst day, uh, on Sunday, there is about a 5% chance that someone will leave behind a archive containing the entire fish kit. 
Um, when you're eating, you know, thousands a day, uh, this isn't a small number. So what I wanted to do is automate retrieval of this. And there's two main methods um, that really kind of came to mind of how to how to find this stuff. The first is obvious, just look in open directories. The second is even dumber than obvious. It's just append.zip to every folder and make a request through. So you have this URL, you strip off nova.php, and then you make a request for void.zip. Then you, if you don't find anything there, or if you do, you then go to the next folder down, and you just keep going, just keep iterating through the, through the URL. Um, we should also kind of take a look and see what else is in these open directories if we find them. RAR files can be interesting, text files can be interesting. We can't download .php files, uh, but these are these can be interesting as they can be mailers or shells or whatnot. Um, this tool also does screen, screen caps, um, and then it does a little bit of uh, hashing on the screen caps to try to help determine um, known phishing domains. And this is just real simple, just convert the image to black and white, make it really small, SSD bit, and then compare it to a to a list. Um, not a great way to, it, like it doesn't replace a signature for the for the kit, um, but it's something. Because sometimes when you're getting a screen cap, the website might take really long to load, and then you end up getting like half of a screenshot or just a little bit of a screenshot. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's the best way. So we'll just look at a little demo of what this does. So in here is an install file. This is all in the GitHub. It tells you what to do. There's not a lot of setup for it. It gives you all the, in, in, all the things you need to install it. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of parameters to it. You can either submit a single URL or you can submit a file of line separated URLs. You can indicate a source, meaning like where you got the URL from, if you'd like to keep track of that way. And then the last thing is you can use a custom user agent if you'd like. Um, Sometimes a lot of these kits will only allow mobile UAs in, so you may want to uh, keep an eye on that. So I, there's a really great website called OpenFish. Uh, if anyone's heard of that, they make um, a free feed available of just UR URLs and the brands that are being fished. Uh, so I have a file that I pulled down earlier, and we'll just kind of parse through that. So what this is going to do is it's going to iterate through the URLs. It's going to say it's processing this URL, and it's going to basically do the exact same things that I just just noted. So it's going to take a screen cap, it's going to save it in the local directory, and then it's going to run through the URLs and try to figure out if it can find uh, an archive existing on the server. So that first one, it found a file um, by just appending .zip to it. Um, the second one also did the same. There's only a couple of URLs in here. Oh man, these are all coming up found. Wow, that's so, that's so crazy. It's totally not a curated list of URLs that have the zip files available on them. So in this way, I'll just, I'll just I'll kill this. But so now we can take a look. So here's our screen cap. It's named with the year, day, year, month, day, time. Came from OpenFish, then the URL. Oops. Ah, fix it. So this is like a, uh, a French phishing page. I don't know entirely what cap.fr does, but um, stealing some information there. Here is a Google Drive or possibly a Dropbox fish, uh, Google accounts, so all the good stuff. So in here we have the, I'm gonna exactly, I'm going to talk exactly about this in like two seconds. But basically it goes through and it just pulls down all the things that are, that are interesting. So that is essentially what uh, Buckle Gripper does. So it saves you a lot of time if you just give it a ton of URLs. It'll just run through, oh, it'll just run through all of these URLs and try to pull the zip files for you and then you can post-process them in any way that you like. Uh, I'd like to advise against this, uh, making a Twitter, Twitter bot that would just tweet out like all of these different fish kits and where to download them from. There's kind of already a lot of free places to get this stuff from, and uh, I mean, do it if you want, but 
Um, I've usually pulled down about 150 to 300 unique kits per day, and I'm happy to provide those at files to anyone that has like a project or a non-commercial type of deal um, where they could utilize that information. Um, this is pretty much what a usual day looks like, just a lot of, a lot of fish kits. Um, and not all of them are interesting, so that's kind of what we'll get into. So what am I doing with these? The biggest thing I'm doing is writing uh, emergent threat signatures with them. Um, looking at the encodings that are being used, the backend, backend PHP, looking at metadata and timestamps to help uh, understand what's going on, what's new and what's old. Um, a lot of reporting, uh, and then archiving all of this stuff for the dirty metric word um, and various later things. So here's an example of a landing page. This is the PHP backend code. Um, the first thing that is usually up here is some kind of block list. So it's like an IP list or UA block list, which is always bad. Um, what they do is they grab a random number in a really weird way. You don't need that last number there, but um, and then it'll co this is just a function to copy all of the fish files of this kit into this newly created folder, um, and then they just shove the user to this newly created folder. Um, so many kits do this. It's basically to get a unique folder for each visit. Um, does anyone see any really obvious issues with this? Like, what could you do knowing that this is occurring? Are they are they blocking like any IPs from hitting it multiple times? Oh, yeah, you just spam it, and I mean, how long would it take to fill up disk if you just hit it with like an HTTP stressor or whatever? Um, I'm not doing that, but what we can do is we can write. <laughs> you know, the VMs are cheap these days. Um, so this is what it looks like in Wireshark if we hit one of these types of pages. Um, the big interesting thing here is this location of the hash. So when they redirect you. Um, down here, with the location, the folder name is just a hash, which doesn't really happen all that often. Uh, so what we can do is we can write a emerging threats uh, signature, or a snort, or suricata signature. Um, this is really simple. It just says if there's a 302 uh, sta status code, and there's location, and the location is a MD5 hash, alert. This could be a possible uh, phishing redirect. So pretty simple. Um, on the flip side of that, when the person is finished and they've given away all their credentials or they've posted in lots of bad words to insult the scammer, um, they come to this page where it's, this is actually doing the PHP mail back to the uh, user. So you can see that they have two email addresses in here because redundancy is important. Um, and they are sending this from Apple, customer-support at spammers. So you can look at that in your mail logs uh, because if you had mail going out from one of your web servers, that could be interesting. Um, they have two separate mail statements here. Uh, usually there's just one. Um, you can see they've set the send variable to these two addresses that appear uh, unique, uh, 419, we can guess what they're doing um, and where they may be from. Uh, but usually if there's two mail statements, uh, one of them may be in, an indicator that there may be a backdoor in this kit. And they, the author might have included uh, a PHP include somewhere else that has their email address in it. Uh, so that's commonly what happens with all these free kits. Uh, this, they've also chosen to make text backups on a compromised server. Always a good idea to keep all your credit card numbers that you've stolen around on somebody else's hardware. Um, and then there is a redirect at the very bottom. This is the most important part. So the user has gone through these pages, they've given away their information, and uh, they'll be kicked out to this, this website. We can write a signature based on this activity too. So looking in Wireshark, this is all fake data um, that we'll get into how it's generated later. Um, this is the post body, so this person has entered in their email address, their password, and their phone number uh, to view a file. And then we get kicked out, we get 302 to, to adobe.com slash rear. Um, so what does that look like in a signature? This is, so it's really easy. Um, but in writing IDS signatures for Snort and Suricata, you can't write a signature that encompasses both of these. Uh, the red is the request, the blue is the response. Uh, but you can use something called a flow bit. And a flow bit just says, if I see something weird in this first part, set a marker, and then anywhere else in the TCP stream, if that marker is set, I can write another rule that will, that will only fire if that marker has been previously set. <clears throat> so that's basically what we're doing here. Uh, we're saying we're looking for an HTTP post with email and pass, pass following email. Uh, and if we see that in traffic, we're going to set a flow bit for just like a generic fish. Like this, and we, can't, we can't alert on this because this is super common, and it doesn't always indicate phishing. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll tell our flow bit to not fire on this, like just be quiet. And then we'll write a second signature that's really easy to read. It looks more like this. So um, basically it looks to see if that flow bit has been set. 
Uh, if it has been set, then the rest of this rule will execute. If it hasn't been set, the rest of this rule will not be processed. Uh, so we're looking for a 302 with a location, uh, HTTP, and then we have just this, regex is just a ton of different websites that are commonly fished. Like you can see American Express in there, Amazon's in there, uh, Microsoft is in there, FedEx, Facebook, all sorts of, all sorts of things. So we can get away with this because this signature, while it looks super gross, won't actually run unless the first one is set. So we kind of cut down the number of, number of traffic, the amount of traffic we're looking at before we actually execute that. So that actually works out really well, and we get a ton of hits on this, uh, because that's the most common thing to do after the fish kit is over, is they kick you out to a legitimate site. <clears throat> so the next part is finding encodings. Um, some of the encodings that are in use, uh, we see AES a ton, implemented in JavaScript. Um, it's probably one of the most common ones, but it's also really easy to beat. Um, we see data URIs used, which happens to come up on Twitter like every eight, eight or nine months. Somebody's like, data URIs are a big deal. We're like, we know they're not. Um, <laughs> JavaScript and escape encodings, which are really common. Uh, we see different variations of Base64, like backwards Base64, some XOR and some custom stuff. Uh, there's a white paper down here that I did a while back that has all these in, uh, in their entirety. But we'll look at one that's more, it's kind of, kind of more interesting. Uh, so initially, this is a phishing page, in case you didn't know. Um, they're using a data URI at the top here. Uh, and if you didn't know to look at this first part, you would just say that, oh, this is adobe.com. And my version of Adobe Online uh, has failed something that doesn't, it's not a thing. Um, that would, wouldn't cause Adobe to fail, but uh, you need to log in. So if we look at the, if we look at the HTML source, uh, we can see that they're using a nested Base64 data URI, which is how they get the, how they get the top uh, the browser bar to display. So this is, they do one refresh for a data here, and then they have a whole bunch of spaces, and then this, this first uh, data URI is closed down here, so all of this in the middle executes. <clears throat> so if we click OK, then we're, then we're sitting here. Decent, pretty decent PDF fish. Um, and it's got like the background, which kind of looks like the online Adobe viewer and whatnot. Okay, not bad. If we look at the decoded content of all this, it's just Edwards Packer, which is super common. I uh, can't really write a signature for that because it's used for good stuff and bad stuff. There are some interesting fields at the bottom uh, that we might be able to write a signature on. But decoding that, we get this part. Um, so we see the window title at the top, uh, and then they're actually using an iframe uh, down to actually display the login page. So without, without knowing any of this, this website I went to, is if I did a takedown for this or whatever, it wouldn't actually get the the real site. So this is good, this is good on the part of the attacker. Um, if I go to that site and visit the iframe that comes up, uh, we see this, and we have some really basic uh, HTML encoding, uh, Java, JavaScript, uh, unescape. Decode that, and we can start to see um, the alert. So this is the initial alert that fired. Your Adobe Online has failed. Rest, uh, and it's it's nice. It's it's like they're doing some jQuery, some JavaScript stuff, and then these guys aren't utilizing uh, normal HTML posts. Uh, they're using uh, jQuery, Ajax type of stuff. So this is a, this is a pretty well done fish. Um, another one. This is to me this is more interesting. Um, so this is the first section of a page. If you looked at the source of this HTML page, this is the first thing you'll see. And we'll just kind of take it step by step. So this looks like hex code, which is eval unescape comes out to be this, which is weird. So we eval, then we unescape. We unescape this code, and then we eval it, in which they've set unescape to a new function. So they've rewritten the functionality of unescape. Um, don't worry about what all this means. It's kind of, doesn't matter for this example, but uh, they've renamed all of the variables hashes and whatnot. If we look at the second part of it, it's another eval unescape. If you looked at this initially, not knowing that the first unescape had different functionality, you might be like, what is, why? That's, you can't unescape this stuff. That's not gonna work, it's gonna error out. Um, at the very bottom of this, blurring it out for just the important part, like this is just this, and then you have a script at the, at the very end. What does this look like? You have an array that kind of goes up, and then it's like an associative array. So making a key. Um, so what they do is this is a custom encoding, kind of just silly, like kind of CTF type of encodings. Um, but this works pretty well, and doesn't it kind of bypasses a lot of security measures and whatnot, so it won't fire. Um, if you decode it with this key, uh, you'll get something that looks much more like the actual HTML page. Um, and then this is just HTML decimal, so you can decode that. 
and uh, that'll be that. So those are some interesting uh, encodings that I've seen. There's a lot more, uh, just don't have time, and they're on that, they're on that white paper. Uh, my slides will be up afterwards. I want to talk a little bit about timestamps. Uh, if you're not in forensics, you probably don't care about timestamps, but I super care about timestamps. Um, so when you pull down a, a zip file, or when you make a zip file, all of the files within the zip, uh, they keep their timestamps. So they don't, they don't change no matter where that zip is copied or anything like that. Once you unzip it, you'll see when those files were last modified or created. Uh, and we can use this knowledge to kind of determine two things. One would be like the deployment age. So we could take the newest PHP, HTML, whatever, file inside the archive, subtract it from today, and we could say that this kit was last modified um, or deployed uh, at this, at like seven days ago or 150 days ago or three years ago. And that gives us some, some valuable information. We can also determine what I'd like to call the relative age, which is just subtracting the date of the newest HTML or PHP file inside of the archive from the oldest one. Um, and this, combined with the deployment age, will give me some more information about when this, if this kit is interesting or not. So if I have an archive that has a high relative, meaning that there's a big delta between files within the zip file, and and the and it was uh, there's a very low deployment delta, this probably just means that it's an old kit that I'm looking at, and it's probably not interesting. Um, so all of the files were changed at the same time within it, and it was deployed um, just recently. So I wouldn't really look at that. Um, if I have an archive that has a low relative and a high deployment, that means that it's just old and all the files inside it were modified around the same time. Um, if they are both high, then I don't care. But if they're both low, then that's really interesting because all the files are modified around the same time. They may be new files um, and, they, and it's been recently deployed. So what I'll do is all of the fish that I'm pulling down, I have a post-processing script that will essentially look through that and say, you know, these are all the kits that have a low relative and low deployment. Uh, so this is one that's not interesting uh, because it has a high relative. So the files in, in here, this is like a Google Drive fish. Um, this stuff hasn't been modified since 2014, um, but the, we can see that you know, March 10th, the verification.php was modified and the index.php was modified. Uh, probably this includes the email address that the fisher updated to make sure that it goes to their information. Um, but one that does look more interesting would be this. Um, and setting aside that they could just simply copy all these files and make a new timestamp here, um, this is this it, this is usually uh, the case. This will be more interesting. This will be a newer fish kit. So this is something for CenturyLink, um, and they have all their all their archive files here that were changed around the same time. Uh, but then the login.php finish and index were all kind of modified around different times, and you can get an idea of how they were updated and what time. So they had it for a few hours uh, before they deployed it. Um, so to me, as someone looking into these, that's interesting. Um, moving on to PDF files. So normally we see the fish links come in emails, um, but I also see a ton of links come through in PDFs. Um, these are super common to find on VT and hybrid analysis. Um, and they can be kind of annoying to have to open the, open the PDF and find the URL inside of it to add it to, the, uh, add it to my processing. So I wrote a little script um, to basically dump out all the, all the links that are in clear and also to go through all of the streams and dump out all of the URLs and streams. So we'll take a look at that real quick. If anybody has any questions, feel free to shout them out. Uh, five, I think. It's my dad's favorite movie. <laughs> All right, so I have a I have a folder here of just some some nice PDF files, um, things that might get sent to your users. Um, please don't things you tell them not to click on that they're going to click on. Um, so if you did something like let's say you used like Suricata or Bro and you were cataloging all the PDF files that came across, you could dump them all into a folder um, and then run a script like this. Um, which would essentially just pull the links uh, out of here. This uses uh, Didier Stevens' PDF parser, a great uh, Python tool, to go through all of the streams and pull this out. And all you do is just give it the give it the location of the PDFs where you stored them, and then it'll spit out the uh, URLs from all of these different PDFs. So some of these PDFs include more than one. Um, you are all within them, and some of them don't actually start off with HTTP, um, which is something I used to use to, to find the links within the PDFs. 
but just a just a simple simple script to pull that out. It's really useful if you kind of keep all your all the PDFs that cross your network around, and uh, and you can just do that every day and, and then utilize that as as Intel for what's going on in your network. Um, but don't forget about Docs. Um, this is kind of a weird one, but I don't know. People do weird stuff. Uh, this is an actual Excel file, so it's not a phishing page yet. Um, and then your file is secured. To, to view the complete one, click here. Like, first thing that comes to mind is like, Drydex, all of the stuff that's going around right now. Um, you know, JAF, uh, all sorts of, you know, macro-based PDF. But this is just a fish PDF. So they've sent an actual fish PDF. Uh, if you kind of look through it and grab for strings or for HTTP, you don't find it in there because it's an XLSX, which just means it's a zip file. If you unzip it and grab through there, then you can find the URL at the bottom. Um, and what they do is they redirect you to an online Excel viewer. Um, I mean, once you've made the sell, once you've made the sale, dude, stop selling. Like you already got them to click the click the uh, XLS document, but they wanted to redirect you out here to, to steal your credentials. Um, so that's something important too. Don't don't forget about documents. <coughs> so, hey. So from the researcher, SOC analyst, uh, network engineer perspective. I've talked to a bunch of people and kind of like got an idea of like, all right, what do you guys do with like fish URLs when you find them? Like, what's the what's your general process? And the process is it sucks like to the point where this they don't do it. Um, but you find the fish URL, you start up a VM, you spin up Wireshark in there, and then you go and visit the landing. Uh, you enter in some fake information. Um, hopefully the kit isn't checking for like valid information. A lot of times there are JavaScript validators on them. You click and then you enter in some more fake information in the next page. Uh, you got to make sure you're using a one validated credit card number because they check for that stuff. Uh, click again, enter in your fake information. Uh, there's been lots of times where I get like weird banks where I don't know like what sort codes are in like like in uh, like Asia or Asia Pack or anything like that. Like they have just very different things, so I'll end up spending a lot of time figuring out uh, what those numbers actually look like. Click again, stop Wireshark, review the PCAP, look for zips, and then. No, this is a big process. This kind of sucks. Um, so I did this probably 50 times a day when I was starting out, and I was like, we don't have very good coverage of, uh, of fish at, at ET, and this is not sustainable. I wrote a lot of signatures, but once I started hitting duplicates, it was just terrible. So I was like, oh, I'll just automate it. That'll be great. Um, I can't do this talk without showing the most true XKCD article uh, to me ever, and it's essentially what you think automation is going to be like and then what it's really like. Um, and the alt text is automating comes from the roots auto, meaning self, and mating, meaning screwing. So this is how I screwed myself. Um, <clears throat> so what this does, what this next script does, Bully Blinder, is it basically automates that whole 14-step process. Um, it uses some really basic, basic, basic techniques to uh, do form filling, handle cookies, redirects, refreshes, JavaScript, um, utilizing Mechanize, Selenium, and Python, a lot of Python. Um, it's best on the the majority of phishing that's going out right now, which utilizes like typical HTTP posts to send credentials um, and HTML uh, forms to have the have your input structured, um, utilize Firefox, uh, and the the general goal of this isn't to really make life harder for scammers. It's to make life easier for me um, and writing signatures and whatnot, and to make sure that we have better coverage. But if entering a lot of fake data, you know, makes somebody's life more difficult, then cool. Um, all, all of the scammers run all of their credentials and whatnot, stuff that they find through like validators anyways. So uh, the only thing that I think is really, that it really helps out is if you have credit cards that you're entering in, uh, and you enter in like one validated credit cards with like a, an expiration and a CVV that looks good, there's not a really good way to find out if that's legit or not because it'll validate. They actually have to either sell it or use it to uh, determine whether or not it's real or not. Blue Blender relies on a really cool Python library called Faker. Um, and this is just, when I found it, I was like, thank God this exists. Um, but basically, you can say, like, give me a fake name, give me a fake email, give me a fake phone number uh, from this locality, give me a credit card number of this type, you know, MasterCard, Visa, whatever, an address, an apartment. You know, you can, it'll just generate all this fake information for you based on whatever you ask for it. So let's take a look at a demo of this. So again, there's an install file that it's pretty much the same uh, same files as Bully as a uh, Buckle Gripper. 
Um, but we do have AES, uh, an AES Python script in here because we see AES a ton and it's just easier to convert that out uh, than it is to pop Selenium for every, uh, every AES encryption we find. The 10k.txt is a password file, so it's just uh, 10,000 common passwords because I don't want to, I want to enter in passwords that look somewhat unique. I don't want to enter in things that just look like garbage. So I'll usually every couple of months I'll go through and say, okay, who got dumped? Who's the latest dump? And just update this with uh, 10,000 passwords or whatever. So what this does, uh, some of the arguments here, you give it a single URL, you can change the user agent if you'd like. The default user agent is like the most common Windows 7, um, one that's around. Uh, I've definitely seen kits that block on user agents, so they won't even allow like Mac or Linux to take a look. All they really want is Windows, fine with me. Um, and then an interface. So this will utilize T-Shark, and as you're going through and doing the form filling, it's going to make make a packet capture for you. That was the name. So like this, I can read in. I have a I have a commit. I just haven't pushed for reading in a list of files. Oh no. Um, so this should be. In. Did I name it something different? Let's just look at one of these. So what it'll do is it'll prepare a PCAP. It'll say that it's processing it. We'll, we'll scroll back through all this information too. It looks kind of garbage because of the font's big so you guys can read it. Um, but it'll go through, it'll hit the first page, look for the form, and then it'll continue going through uh, until it finds something. So it hit, a, hit an error that it didn't, that the last part wasn't a document, but we still have the PCAP. So if we take a look at the PCAP, We have a get, so this is the calf.fr. Um, we can see that this was made by Jason Bourne. Crap, we're screwed, guys. Uh, <laughs> but so this is this is the, the fish landing. See, it's a, that's the login page. This is one of the ones that we looked at initially. It's from the same feed. And then we have our post here. So we can see kind of what this looks like. So we filled this in with some fake information. And some of it's good, some of it's not. Uh, we don't have a, it's not smart enough to know what a province is. <laughs> So it, if it doesn't know what a form, a form field is, it'll just enter in like some business jargon, because I think that's funny. Um, but a lot of this stuff is through here. So we have the we have the email, uh, swilliams at hotmail.com, a password of Scream, and a double, another probably a check password. Um, but so we have all this information here, and then it kicks us out to the actual real page, uh, calf.fr. So that worked there. Let me do what for. And then in the output here, eh, let me do a different, let me do a different one. Let's do this one. This is a fish for blackboard. Sound effects. <clears throat> All right, so this is a shorter one, a little bit easier to read. So we made the PCAP, we processed that URL. Uh, it's, show, it's showing you what uh, the form looks like before it actually makes the post. So it's made a user ID of KBAC, a password of weapon, uh, and then it submits that through. The next page that it hits is actual www.blackboard.com, uh, which it knows to be a legitimate website. Uh, so it considers the fish done, um, and then it spits out the, the URL request chain. <clears throat> so, whew, no Jason Bourne on this one, that's good. 
Um, but this is, the, this is the Blackboard site. We can see the title there. Um, scroll down. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. A lot of things that, if I was looking for the form, this might take a few minutes, but whatever. Just let the script do it. And then we have our post. So this is exactly what, what we saw on the other side of the script. Um, just the user ID of Quebec was submitted, weapon, and now we have a PCAP that we can utilize. We can run this through our, uh, our uh, you know, security tools, whatever, make sure that we're covered. If we had a user um, that had actually clicked on this before, then we can write a signature for this to determine whether or not uh, this happens again. And then they were kicked out to the real Blackboard website. Um, so kind of just some more examples of what this looks like. Uh, this is a really common Google Doc fish. If you click on one of these um, different service providers to give away your information, uh, it looks like it makes a pop-up. But if you look at the HTML code, it's actually the form is on the first page. Uh, so the script would go through, it would look at that page, it would scrape that form, and it would do exactly what we just saw. Um, so it'll post that information, and here's what it looks like in Wireshark. Some of them get more complicated than that. A lot of times they don't give you the form just on the first page. Um, this one, if you click any of the um, brands to enter in your information to view this document, you get a pop-up window. That, that's slightly more interesting. Um, and if you look at the code, they use the JavaScript pop-up window to do that. And the script is smart enough to, to see that and then process the pop-up instead of being like, well, I hit, the, I hit the page and I didn't see a form, so I don't know what you want me to do. Uh, it'll, it'll keep going through that. This is the redirect that we saw initially, uh, or earlier, just uh, showing that spits out the spits out the same information. This Apple one is a little bit more interesting in that we hit the first page. There's a form on there. Cool. So we fill the form. We hit the second page, and it's oh no time. So we have AES encryption uh, through JavaScript, um, but the script again is smart enough to be able to process that. Um, so we hit the first page. We find a form. No big deal. We submit it off. Um, we hit the second page and see an AS encryption, we decode it, and then we fill the information in here. Um, and this looks, this is kind of what I'm shooting for, and there's probably more work to be done on this, but making this information look as real as possible uh, is, is pretty cool. So I've sent off, sent them an actual fake generated credit card number with a name, a CVV, an expiration date, that all looks kind of real. Date of birth, that doesn't look so real, um, but it's got a social security number in there, so who could resist? Um, and then you have the URL request chain at the bottom to kind of tell you like where where it's gone. So this there's a lot of trial and error here. Um, it's take it's taken a lot of a lot of work to find all of these different redirects. I'm not going to go through all these, but these are just some of the things that occur. Like JS uh, top that location redirects are a way to kind of break spiders and whatnot that may not be able to be able to parse JavaScript. Um, Bitly, Twitter, Cloudflare all have these warning pages that pop up and they're like, hey, you might be clicking on a fish page. I'm like, yeah, I want to click on the fish page. Um, so you have to bypass those. Um, a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, so some of the new, some of the newer kits utilize jQuery and Ajax. Um, it's not the norm, uh, but I definitely expect it to go this way uh, more often than not. It's just really a threshold of, of talent uh, for people to develop kits that don't utilize just a dumb H HTML post. Uh, sometimes there's more than one post on a page. Um, so like there could be a search bar at the top, and that could be, um, we don't want to submit a search, we want to submit the form that's after that. So we have to do some trickery to get around that too. Um, the countermeasures, they always utilize a UA block list, um, and sometimes it helps them, but it's really easy to get around. Uh, IP block list, same deal, just don't be on the block list. They block list things like Amazon, EC2, uh, you know, a lot of security companies, just. You know, do it from a VPN. Uh, they, they block a lot of them. Block Tor. Um, do it from like you know uh, any of the decent VPNs that you think one of these guys might use, and you're going. They're not going to they're not gonna block themselves. Um, <laughs> so just do that. Uh, mobile UAs. That I don't really have anything in place for that. It's kind of hard to. You'd have to make that first request and then see. Okay, no, I got I got denied probably because it's looking for a mobile UA. Uh, something I'm working on, but something that's not in there too. Um, geolocation, uh, if you have something, uh, a, a modern VPN service, you can have lots of exit points. Uh, so you can set this up to determine locality first and then send it out the right exit point. Uh, a lot of times I'm looking at this stuff and I'm like, my script is just garbage, it's not working. I pull it up and I look at the page and it's like a broken form. Like they didn't include like an end, 
an end bracket or they didn't like properly quote something or whatnot, so it doesn't actually work at all. Um, so if they would you know, do proper coding, that'd be a lot better for me. Just a small request. Um, <laughs> so Fishers, please improve your code. Stop being bad at code. Um, a lot of times there may be misconfigurations. Uh, sometimes if you're hitting a phishing page that's been up for a little while, um, the hoster or the owner of the page might have taken down part of it. So like they deleted like the backend PHP script, which actually sends off the, sends off the information to the scammer. Um, but they don't actually delete the uh, landing and whatnot. So I just think it's, as you run through this stuff, sometimes it's not always the script. It's not always you. Um, if you wanted to do this kind of stuff, there's no reason why you can't. Um, but just make, just be smart about it. Use a VM. Uh, there's no reason an exploit couldn't sit on a fish landing page. Uh, we definitely see instances where they will include a uh, key logger or some kind of Trojan after the fish. So they're like, well, we got your credentials. You're probably going to be dumb enough to download and run this too. Um, we see that a lot, but we don't see like an EK fish like all in one, which I think would be cool. So do that. Um, if you're running this stuff, don't use your work, home, or personal IP space for obvious reasons, and really just don't be a doofus. Um, so the last part of the last part I want to talk about is kind of writing the ET uh, IDS signatures for this kind of stuff. We covered a couple of them already, and uh, just a couple examples. So this is a pretty common DocuSign uh, fish that we see. Again, it's like the multi select your email provider. That's great. Um, th this title jumps right out. Um, and after, because I acquire so many fish kits and I'm pulling out all the metadata, I can go through and look and see, all right, how common is this title uh, over all the kits that I've grabbed? And it turns out it's pretty common. Uh, so we can just simply write a signature that just looks at the title and uh, it's just HTML decimal uh, that just says DocuSign. Um, and we can write a signature just based on that. Uh, another landing here. Uh, if we look at the source code, there's some things that you wouldn't expect to find in a Google Drive uh, normal page. So you can write a signature just based on some of the content in the page. You don't have to make it super fancy. Uh, this stuff will still run uh, very well on a sensor. Um, we can pull out the fields that we think are important and, and interesting and then kind of go from there. Um, the landings are kind of the lowest uh, severity, uh, so they aren't really interesting. I really want to help out socks and analysts that are looking at this stuff and be like, hey, somebody lost their credentials. This is an interesting thing, like go start your investigation type stuff. And that's what this is. So this is a this is kind of personalized to the organization. Like it'll look at the email address um, that they've submitted to you. So when they send you the link, they'll include your email address in the link. And then based on whatever the domain is in your email address, they'll say, you know, this is uh, Bob Shoes or whatever. Um, and then, you know, they'll pre-populate your information in here and whatnot. Um, so looking at this initially, um, we see this hellion.php. Oh, I know what that is. That's Team PBG, those guys. Um, so I can write a signature just based on seeing a post with that in the URL and then content of pass. So looking inside of the, uh, inside of the HTTP client body, um, I'll, make sure, I'll add that in there to make sure it kicks off a couple of false positives. We can also write a, write a signature based on the content of each of these uh, arguments inside of the HTTP client body. And that ends up looking something like this. Um, there's also, they also include email equals in the post request. So this is like a personalized, they're looking to fish someone specifically. Um, so we include that and then we can say that this is a personalized WA web webmail fish. Just using all of these forms, and these are just easy, these are super easy six to write. Um, we're not doing anything super crazy. Um, it's really common for these guys to host stuff on free domains um, like Hostinger or any of the millions of companies that seem to think that they can make a business model based on free stuff. Um, so this one will basically look at, we see that they're using 16mb.com, uh, which is one of the Hostinger free domains. Uh, and then they get, they get kicked out to match.com after they've entered their information in there. Uh, so what we can do is we can write a signature based on that. So just say post, username, pass, and then utilize a regular expression, everybody's favorite thing ever, um, to just only fire on things that, fire on domains um, for the hosting or free domains. Uh, and that makes things a lot, makes things very easy there. Sometimes they're smart and they do things that make sense. So this is Outlook Web App. This isn't like a weird one like the one back here, like where you're like, eh, it doesn't look like WBA. Um, and then they're asking for kind of things that you would expect to see. Um, they've also included like super weird things as their parameters. 
So I have no email equals, I have no pass equals in here. And just looking at this, this looks like somebody typed this, like, purposefully. Like, it looks kind of like they're using, I don't know, if I was just typing random stuff on the keyboard, this might be something that I enter in there. Uh, so I know that I can't use those parameters um, as, as, the, uh, as parts of a signature. But the page that they're redirected to, which is this OVVA, maybe that looks like OWA, but it's not, it's two Vs, don't be fooled. Um, is just loads up with this, and then this will redirect to office365.com. Why don't you just redirect in this page? I don't know, but this is what we're doing. So I can write a signature based on this subsequent landing page, uh, because the only way that someone would logically get here would be to enter in credentials, because they're not going to go directly to ovva.php. Uh, so I can utilize this information right here as a signature. And we just utilize the content of this page, so this meta refresh, uh, office365.com, and then this title of account success. This only, sh this shows up for like no time, so what's the point of even having it here? I mean, thank you for the free sig. But, um, so this is what that would look like. So there's the successful OWA fish based on the uh, server response uh, to the request. And we can write up a, write up a signature that way. So those are a lot of the common things that we deal with. Um, I'm working on adding many features to these scripts. If anybody has ideas for these, I'm super open to them. Um, uh, as well as other related scripts. You can, you know, there's no Pinterest apparel here yet. Uh, there's no Bully Buster, but there will be. Um, I also have a site, Fish Total. It's not, there's nothing there yet, so don't even bother. But my idea is I want to make a public website where anyone, so similar to, yeah, Virus Total. Um, you can submit a URL or a PDF file, and we can do this kind of automation and do a similar uh, similar thing to Irish Total. I'm also working on a phishing framework, think like set, but for defenders, um, where you can essentially handle notifications, uh, have a back-end database, everything like that, um, so that you can, anyone that's interested in kind of doing this type of work can uh, do it and share it through, with others through like MISC or any of the other information sharing frameworks. So that's pretty much it for me. Does anybody have any questions about this whole thing? Uh, the encodings, uh, the different han handling the different landing pages and trying to figure out what is actually part of a template and actually what's part of like a one-off, uh, like somebody just tried to do something different to be interesting. Um, but definitely going through and finding all the different encodings and getting the script to actually make the HTTP post when there's no actual form on the page. Um, that logic is somewhat long and compli complicated. Uh, I'm sure if someone else did it, it'd be way better, but I'm doing it, so that's it. Thanks, though. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you spending the afternoon here, and I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of the conference. Feel free to come grab me if you want to talk about anything afterwards. Thank you.